Well, good evening. I'm so happy to be here. And I was just um, looking at the chat and seeing how many people are here and where you're all from. And it's just, just a delight. Um, so um, I'm Liz Thompson, Vermont Land Trust, and I'm joined by my uh, wonderful colleague, Bob Zeno. Bob, you want to just say hello for a second? I'm going to start talking, but. Yeah, hi, it's great to be here. All right, great. So we're talking about old forests tonight, and we love old forests. Um, we, the title of the talk is Old Forests, Mosses, Mushrooms, and Mammals. And the photo in the background is neither a moss, nor a mushroom, nor a mammal. It's actually a lichen. And so we're going to talk about some of the things that you can see in the winter um, in an old forest, including lichens, mosses, mushrooms, and mammals. Um, so things that you can, you can enjoy at this time of year. We'll also talk a little bit about a couple of places where you can go visit old forests and why old forests are important. So what is old forest or old growth forest? Old growth forest is a more restrictive term for what we're talking about, but old growth forests are forests that have developed over time. And time is the key element of old growth forests. Our colleague, Charlie Cogbill says, describes it as continuity of process over time is the thing that defines old growth forests. Three to four centuries without human intervention, says our colleague David Foster of Harvard Forest. And our colleague Bob Leverett, uh, who studied old growth forests all over the place, but particularly in Massachusetts, says in, in these things, it, continuity of process, long periods of time, whether or not the forest has experienced catastrophic natural disturbance and whether or not the trees in it are now are old. So it doesn't have to have old trees and it doesn't have to have a lack of catastrophic disturbance. Other terms that we hear in the ecological literature and just in the popular press, primary forest, meaning the first forest, original forest, virgin forest, the forest primeval, ancient forest and ancient woodland are some terms that we hear. Bob, would you describe, talk to us what we mean when we say old forest? Sure, and the thing about old growth forest is that there's almost none of it in Vermont. It's uh, when there are maybe those few places that truly are old growth, they're incredibly special. But what we have much more of, uh, still not a whole lot, but more that we can really go out and find on the landscape is old forest. Forest that doesn't meet that strict definition of old growth, but that it's regaining those characteristics of an old growth forest, or you could say it's on its way. It's typically a forest where the oldest, oldest trees are starting to get up to 100, excuse me, 150 years old. But uh, it's not just old trees. It's a forest that starts to experience changes where the trees are, uh, some trees are dying, new trees are coming in, and the forest is becoming much more complex. And th that complexity is the characteristics of old growth that accumulate over time. There we go. Oops, I may have advanced too many slides. Forgive me. So those characteristics that you might see in some old forests are listed here, like trees of many ages, some of which are very large and old, uh, starting to decay or fall apart. And that results in canopy gaps and downed wood that's decaying on the forest floor. There's uh, mycorrhizal networks from the fungi that are in that forest. And Liz is gonna talk a little bit more about that in detail. There's standing deadwood, there's tip up mounds when the roots of a tree have tipped up and are now upright and in the air. And there's just a general sense of seeming disarray. It's messy. And all of those things combine to make old forests so biologically rich. What can you see in, in an old forest in the winter? What's, what's your experience going to be like? Well, this is what the forest might look like right now. Um, with some recent snow. This is an old cedar swamp in northern Vermont, in Lowell, Vermont. 
And on looking in this picture, I can see that there's mossy, this mossy trees and, and just a lot of uh, tip, trees tipping over. Um, we can try to do botany in the forest in the winter, but it's a little challenging. Anybody know what this plant is? <laughs> it's covered with snow. And we can enjoy old trees. This is an old sycamore in Ferrisburg. We can even hug trees. That's my son when he was young, hugging a cottonwood in, in the Burlington area. Um, we can hunt for signs of wildlife. And Bob is gonna talk about that later. We can stoop down and look at the bases of trees and see what's there. We can look at the sides of trees, at the trunks of trees and look at the moss. We can get out our hand lenses our magnifying lenses and look more closely at the various many, many things, the myriad things that are growing on tree trunks. So getting back to those characteristics of old forests that Bob was talking about, um, we can talk, uh, one of the things is that we see down wood in all stages of decay. And remember that, that I quoted Bob Leverett, uh, so, who said that, it doesn't matter if, the, um, if there are standing old trees. And this is a picture in a forest that where all the old trees blew down in the hurricane of 1938. This is in Southwestern New Hampshire. Um, and all the standing trees and live trees are young trees, but it's still an old growth forest. And so there's lots of down trees in all stages of decay. And uh, Thoreau, when he was visiting the Maine woods, one of the things he said, he said, is it, it's all mossy and moosey. <laughs> and um, he, he was actually pretty taken aback by his visit to the North Woods, in, to the Maine woods, and, and was, you know, not entirely comfortable there. Um, but this is how he described it. And um, I would say it's also messy. This is, and, um, but don't despair, um, says this writer. Um, when trees fall down, as they did in the Pisgah Forest in southwestern New Hampshire, this is a quote that I found in an article that it was published just yesterday in the New Yorker in my news feed. I saw this, um, a, the, a tree called tree number 103 in Elders Grove in the Adirondacks um, fell down in December. It was the tallest tree in the Adirondacks, 160 plus feet tall, um, 345 years old. It was a white pine and it was just had done its time and it fell. Um, but he says, the author of the article says, do not despair. The tree is no longer thrusting into the sky, but it lives on as forest debris, making fungi and bugs happy. That's what we're talking about today. And uh, scientist who was quoted in the article said, it's dead, yes, but I prefer to think that it's just not vertical anymore. So here's a down pine, a pine log that has been down for a while in our own Cambridge Pines forest in Northern Vermont. And this tree actually, you can see by the lateral branches on it that it's actually an open grown tree. It was not old. It was not as old as that tree in, in Elders Grove in the Adirondacks. It was actually relatively young, but it has fallen down and it's providing all kinds of habitat for mosses and other things in that Cambridge Pines forest. Now look at this one. This is a great one because this is this is sort of the introduction to the to the stuff I'm going to talk about for the next couple of minutes, few minutes. Um, if you look at this log, Look at this and you will see all kinds of organisms. You're gonna see moss, the, the mostly green stuff. Actually, I think I need to do this. Um, you can see lichens, which are on the, on the top of the log and you can see mushrooms on the side, lower side of the log. So first of all, we're gonna talk a little bit about mosses and their kin. Mosses are in the group, a class of, of organisms or plants called bryophytes, which includes mosses, uh, liverworts, and hornworts. And you'll see this is a moss that, that was growing on a tree in Williams Woods in Charlotte. And you can see these, these funny projections coming out from the edge of the moss. There's the green part of the moss and the, the projections coming out. 
Well, I will have to tell you that mosses and this aspect of mosses was one of the things that excited me as a young person, as a seventh grader, when I took a science class and the teacher took us actually out into the field, out into the woods, which is a really unusual thing at that time. We did not go on field trips. But she took us on a field trip and what she wanted to show us was exactly what you're seeing here. She wanted to show us hair cat moss and how it reproduces. And what you see here is the, the green part of the moss, the part that we're mostly familiar with, but we're also quite familiar with these things that, that come up from the moss. And this is where the spores are produced. The spores are produced in these, in these what we call capsules. And there's a hairy cap on top of these capsules. And when you take that hairy cap off underneath it, this is what you see. You see that, that um, more shiny capsule in which the spores are produced. And this is, this is uh, the part of the plant that produces new spores that will spread on the wind and, and create new plants. Um, this fascinating life cycle of mosses, and I won't go into the details of it, but it's just fascinating. And it is what sort of turned me on as a young person to become a botanist. So where can we find mosses and their kin? We can find them on the forest floor. Mosses need moisture. Mosses need it wet. Um, they have, do not have, so in this picture where you see all the mosses on the forest floor, and there's, in this picture, there's probably 20, at least 20 species of moss in this picture, from sphagnum mosses in the foreground to bazania or th three-lobed bazania, a liverwort in the middle. Um, but when you look at these mosses and think about how they function, they do not have vascular tissue like the trees do. They are not able to, um, to, to take water up and move at great distances like tree trunks can. So they have to be wetted. They have to be wet all the time. And if they're not wet, they can hang out and wait. They can hang out and wait for the water to come back. They can, like a resurrection plant, they can dry up and desiccate. But in order to really thrive, to photosynthesize and to reproduce, they need to be wet and they, they thrive on water. Um, so these are some of the first plants that actually, um, that actually, began to develop on land, some of the first land plants. And they're much older um, than, than, they've been around much longer than flowering plants. Um, there are about 25,000 kinds of mosses in their kin worldwide and about 700 or so in Vermont. So a lot of different species. And where they like to grow, well, sometimes they grow on tree, the, the bottoms of tree trunks where it's moist, and a lot of times on the side of a tree. And here's another instance of mosses growing on a tree trunk with a, with a uh, mushroom growing out of it. They especially like complicated tree trunks. This is an old tree trunk. This is an old yellow birch, which has a complex bark. And so just a lot of great microhabitats and places for the mosses to attach. They also like to grow on down wood. For example, on this, in this down log, this, this picture right here, look at all the color in that photo. And the, all those different colors reflect different species of moss. There's also some lichens in this photo. Mo mosses and lichens and a great diversity of them on this fallen tree in the forest floor. Look a little closer and you can see, again, you can see the diversity of things that is growing on that, on that one, down log, and this is not even a remarkable down log. Mosses can also grow on rocks, but again, you know, they need to have, have some moisture. So you'll find them often in, for, in a spray zone, for example, of a waterfall or something like that. Mosses have a lot of function in the forest. They, because they gather water and hold it in, the, in between the, the stems of the moss. Now there can be as many as 300 stems of moss in a single square inch. Can you imagine that? It, those are tiny mosses. But because they're so tightly packed together, um, when it does rain, they hang onto that water and provide a moist seedbed for other plants, including um, things like these yellow birch seedlings and also some, some other uh, herbaceous, here's, here's a, a, another seedling, some other plants growing in the, in the moss. They also provide habitat for mushrooms because of the moisture. Well, one of the mosses that is 
is uh, commonly found in old forests um, and less commonly in young forests. Now, let me just say, you don't have to go to an old forest to find moss. You know that. You can find moss anywhere. But you're going to find more moss in an old forest because of the complex structure, because of all that down wood, because it's messy, because there's all kinds of, of moist habitat there um, that where the trees have fallen and are decaying. Um, but this one, this particular moss is called Necora, Necora pinnata, and it is one of the mosses that is not restricted to old forests, but it does, does tend to grow on old trees. And so therefore it is more common in old forests than in younger forests. And there's another view of it. And uh, so, and when you look at this photo, and this is, this, this is the same tree, this is actually an old, um, brown ash, you can see that the, um, the Necora moss is here, but also look at this closely at this thing here. And here's another look at that thing taken in the winter by Bob and a closer look at this thing. And this is a lichen called uh, Loberia pulmonaria or lung lichen. And here's a closer look at the lung lichen. And you can see why it's called lung lichen here. It, it almost looks like the inside of a lung. Um, it's a big showy lichen and it is found on, on old trees primarily. And so it's often found in old forests, not necessarily a, an obligate old forest species, but it is more common in old forests. Lichens are fascinating things because they are um, a little bit uh, odd in that they're hard to define. A lichen is a, combination, a symbiotic association between a fungus and, a back, and, and a, an alga, either a green alga or a cyanobacteria, which is commonly called blue-green algae. Um, so a, a, a tight association between those two things um, creates a lichen. And these have developed, there's three kinds of lichens that we think of. And this is just a, a way that, um, that scientists classify them. It's somewhat of an artificial classification, but, but we think about the ones like this that are leaf-like um, or what we call folios. And then some of them that are more crust-like, like this one, and some of them that are like, as in the left-hand side of this picture, that are more kind of tree-like. Those are the three basic kinds of lichens. Um, there's again, there's there's a lot of there's about 17,000 species of lichens um, that have been described worldwide. And um, I don't know how many there are in Vermont. It's a lesser known group. Um, but there's but there's lots of them. Um, and British soldiers is one. I don't have a photo of that. But that's one that you're probably quite familiar with a, a common lichen. Well, so so um, Speaking of fungi as part of lichens, let's move on to the fungi. And fungi um, include all kinds of things like this very iconic, uh, common and poisonous uh, mushroom called fly agaric. Um, this, is a, this is a mushroom in the Amanita genus, um, which is a group of, of some, some deadly poisonous mushrooms and some that are um, somewhat poisonous and some that have some um, medicinal qualities. Um, this one is among those. I don't recommend trying it. Um, but, but this one is one that's one of the ones that when we talked about mycorrhizal networks, and I'm just going to show you another one. This is a, a red mushroom, a common red mushroom that you've probably seen in the genus Rustula. And here's another common mushroom that you've probably seen in the genus Lactarius. Now these photos, these three photos were all taken in the summer. These are not things you're gonna see in the winter, but the reason that I wanted to show you these three mushrooms is because these are th among the mushrooms that do form these mycorrhizal networks that we were talking about, where there is again, a symbiotic or a mutualistic, mutually beneficial relationship between the fungus the underground portion of the fungus, the mycelium of the fungus, and tree roots and vascular plant roots, in which the fungi, the roots of the, the, the my, mycelium of the fungus, the hair-like threads that are underground that spread widely underground, take up 
water and nutrients from the soil and help feed those to the tree roots. And the tree roots in turn um, pass nutrients that the, that the uh, mushroom cannot get from the tree back to the fungus. And so it's a mutualistic arrangement in which nutrients are exchanged, nutrients and water are, ex are exchanged between the fungus and the vascular plant. It's quite an amazing thing. And these mycorrhizal networks are critical to the functioning of forested ecosystems. They're something that we're learning, just really learning about um, a lot through the work of a scientist uh, named Suzanne Simard, who's done most of her work in the Pacific Northwest and has written quite a lot about these mycorrhizal networks. And um, this is a, a, a schematic from a, a New York Times article that came out a couple of years ago on this exact phenomenon, um, which is quite an amazing thing. So in addition to the, the mushrooms that form these mycorrhizal networks, we also have some fungi that grow on trees that are not part of the mycorrhizal network, but have functions in the decay of, of trees in the ecosystem. This is one such fungus. This is a, a broadly known as shelf fungus, and this one is called tinder fungus or horse's hoof mush fungus. Tinder fungus because it has been used for thousands of years, literally 3,000, no, more like 5,000 years. Humans have used this uh, as tinder because if you light a match to this, it burns very, very, very slowly and will hold a fire for a long time. Um, and then we have uh, other ones, things like the, this false turkey tail mushroom, which is another decay fungus. Um, sulfur shelf or hen of the woods. This was taken in summer, but these, the evidence of these is still there in the winter. Um, Fomatopsis, this one, which is one of the decay fungi, um, which help, fungi which help to decay the wood um, that has fallen to the forest floor. And this one, hemlock varnish shelf, which grows, it's, this one is a pathogen, it's a tree pathogen. It does kill hemlock trees, it lands on living hemlock trees and kills them. But also later it transitions to being a decay fungus, helping that tree to decay and return nutrients to the ecosystem. These, this picture was taken, um, this is actually a fallen, the base of a fallen hemlock tree in a swamp where these, these uh, shelf fungi were growing. So going back to the mosses for a second and just to transition to Bob, I want you to take a close look at this picture and hopefully you can see the dots, the little black dots, which are, um, which are in insect-like things. They're not exactly insects, but um, these are, and um, here's a closer look at that. So you can see those things. And let me just um, play this video. These are so-called snow fleas, also known as springtails. And so these are some of the really fascinating wildlife that you can see in the winter woods. So um, snow fleas are not fleas. They don't bite and don't be afraid of them. It's really fun to stoop down at the base of a tree and look for these things at this time of year. So that's, uh, I'm, with that, I'm gonna transition to Bob. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Liz. I just realized we're going from one of the smallest critters you might see in the woods to uh, one of the biggest with these tracks here, uh, tracks you might see early in the winter in old forest. And uh, before uh, going into detail on this particular animal, uh, there's a conception, I think, that old forests are not particularly rich in wildlife habitat, that they uh, that they're wildlife deserts even. And uh, that's not really true. I think that it comes from this idea that our old forests are the older forests we see widespread on our landscape, which really in forest ages are not that old. Most of our forests that we are typically around is probably uh, 60 to 100 years old. And it's uh, it's regrown from past land uses, maybe from past agricultural use of the land. 
Uh, at one point, Vermont was almost entirely cleared. And it's a forest that's regaining characteristics. And it's not at that stage where it starts developing that complex structure. And so it's the forest that we see and think of as our oldest forest up to like 100 years old is not particularly great for wildlife. It lacks that diversity. As the forest gets older from that point on, past 100 years to 150, and, and for the many hundreds of years after that, the forest continue, continue to uh, persist it becomes richer again in wildlife habitat. And the species, like Liz was saying, the ones that I'm gonna talk about now are not obligates of old forests. All the things I'm gonna talk about, you can see in other forests too. But I wanna make the point that, that these things are in old forests and that old forests uh, have characteristics that make them good for many species of wildlife. And so if you, if you haven't guessed it by now, these are black bear tracks, uh, a species that of course is is safely denned up for the winter, but uh, you might see in the late fall, I think these are, uh, uh, you know, there's not much snow on the ground when these tracks are, are made. And make sure I can still advance the slides here. There we go, there's the black bear, not in winter. But what you will see of, of black bears in the winter time is evidence of their feeding on American beech trees. And these are trees that have very smooth gray bark. Uh, they almost look like elephant legs, perhaps. Uh, and the bears will climb these trees to eat the energy-rich beech nuts that are, at the, that are uh, produced by the trees. And their claw marks scar the tree as the bears are going up and down. And you can see here in this photo uh, some blonde scratching where the claw mark is relatively recent, and then older, long scratches uh, next to it that uh, have started to regrow and heal and they become thicker and darker. And when there's concentrations of American beech, the bears will uh, really use these stands uh, as key feeding areas in the fall. And they're really critical to the overwintering survival of the bears. When the bears go up into the trees sometimes, they'll uh, really go at the tree and they'll sit up there and they'll just break branches and pull them in towards the center of the tree and, uh, and eat the nuts off the branch. And with enough time and broken branches, the trees get this uh, clump of, of half dead branches that retain their leaves uh, that looks like a nest and they're called bear nests. They're not, they're not literal nests. The bear doesn't nest up there. It's certainly not laying eggs up there, uh, but they have that look, and this is a great photo of the nest from below by Susan Morse, but what's more common to see in the woods is something like this from a distance. And I think you can really see that, that resemblance to a bird nest. Uh, but if you look closely when you're finding these and can note that they're on these smooth gray American beech trees, uh, it's a key sign, well, that and the, the claw marks on the tree are key signs that these are bear feeding areas. So there's that on the left, that elephant leg like American beech, smooth gray bark. Unfortunately, most of our beech trees don't look like that uh, because of a non native pathogen, beech bark disease. And you can see the evidence of that pathogen on this beech tree on the right. You can also see some claw marks in the lower center of the photo, but all those little round, knobby, warty, uh, wounds on the tree are evidence of the beech bark disease. And this introduced pathogen is really changing the role of beech in our forests. There's uh, records from the earliest land surveys where surveyors were using trees as a way to uh, mark land boundaries, but they were recording the species that they were seeing. And the most common species that was recorded in the, the forest uh, in that earliest European settlement period were American beech. Uh, it comprised something like, I think, 60 to 70 percent or maybe even more of the forest in northern New England. Very, so it was a very common tree. Today, its role has really changed. And because of the beech bark disease, many of the older overstory trees are dying, losing their crowns, and uh, eventually dying and decaying. And because beech can sprout from its roots, those 
the root systems from those mature trees will send up many, many young saplings of American beech. And so the understory of the forest can have abundant American beech, sometimes to the exclusion of all other species, uh, but the overstory canopy trees, the, uh, those elephant legs, uh, are something that's much, much less common in our forest. The good news for bears and other species that depend on the beech nuts is that many of the trees still seem able to produce nuts, even though they aren't reaching the sizes maybe that their uh, grandfather and great-grandfather trees were reaching at one time. Evidence of another uh, animal that you might see in the woods are these tooth marks gnawing on the bark high up in a tree, in this case on a white birch. You might find this in association with this trough-like track that looks a little messy, uh, like the animal was sort of waddling around, dragging its belly on the snow. Not necessarily always clear, but it's an easy track to follow through the woods. And of course, if you don't know what a track is, sometimes you can just follow it and figure out what left the track behind. And this particular case, it didn't take long to lead to this yellow birch tree. And yellow birch, Liz already mentioned, it, it's another one of the very common tree species in the forest in our common northern hardwood forest. And she mentioned the very intricate patterns of, of yellow birch. And here it is unencumbered by all that mossy stuff. Yellow birch is a tree that likes to germinate on downed wood or tip up mounds produced by dead trees. So here's a uh, yellow birch seedling on the left in this photo and it's just getting started on this big downed log. And it sends its roots down through this, down into this log and eventually they go through the log and into the forest floor and that log decays over time. And you might find what I like to call a walking birch or a stilt birch because it's got these uh, seeming legs at the base. And that's because the, those were in either a tip up mound of soil where the soil collapsed over time or that down log or stump that it germinated on decayed over time and left the roots up in the air. Well, giving away the story there. In this particular tree, uh, that's led to some nice cavities down in those root systems that get reinforced by that snow cover. Lynn showed a photo of, of cavities higher up in a tree where they get hollowed out maybe by woodpeckers or other uh, animals using the tree. And those, of course, are great places for animals to nest or den. Uh, flying squirrels will use those in the winter. But underneath the tree, you might have followed that uh, trough-like track to this little den of a porcupine. And if you're not lucky enough to see the porcupine, often you'll see the scat, which they leave in abundance around their dens. You can see that on the right there. If you're in a high elevation old forest, which looks a little different than a typical uh, northern hardwood old forest, the trees might not be as big. They might be stunted because of the extremes of the elevation. Of course, in winter, uh, a high elevation or north, northeastern, uh, northeast kingdom spruce fir forest might look something more like this. You might come across these uh, relatively small tracks in this classic two, two pattern where there's two feet, two feet, two feet, all spaced apart. And that's an American Martin. A uh, rare species in Vermont, one that's on the threatened and endangered list, uh, restricted to the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont and the Southern Green Mountains where it was introduced, uh, I hope I have this right, in the 80s or 90s. And it's been slowly expanding its range. It's a species that depends on the, the downed logs and, and uh, structure of the forest. And one of the things it can do, it can use that that downed log structure is a way to get in and out of the subnivian zone under the snow and find passageways and hunt under the, under the snow cover.
with all the trees getting old in an old forest, they they fall over and then they leave this up in the sky, this canopy gap where there's light coming in through the forest, into the forest and onto the forest floor and sparking regeneration. And where you have canopy gaps, you might be able to find species that are typically associated with our youngest forests, uh, not thought of as old forest species, but are present in small numbers uh, throughout old forests where you have these dynamics, these uh, young forests within old forest. And so here's some bird tracks uh, of a ruffed grouse. And here's a, you might be lucky enough to see wing prints. And I think, I think what happened in this photo, uh, I couldn't capture the whole thing, but from the right side, there were tracks going towards where that little hole in the snow is. It's sort of covered by a leaf. And I think the grouse went into that hole and then reemerged at some later time. And uh, you can see the wing prints and then the, the footprints continued uh, beyond to the left. And here, of course, is a ruffed grouse in the, uh, not in the winter. Of course, what most of us know ruffed grouse for is startling us because you hear their wing beats when they uh, suddenly fly up and away. Another animal associated with those patches of young forest and regeneration is this one. And with these distinctive tracks of small front feet and big hind feet. And this one, get to the next slide. There we go. This track can be a little confusing because the hind feet are in front or in the top of the photo here and the front feet are in the bottom of the photo, but it's moving up. So the hind feet are in the direction of its travel and it's the snowshoe hare. And if you can picture, here's our snowshoe hare and it gets all, all set and it leaps forward with its front feet and its front feet land, the two smaller prints. And then its big hind feet come up through around the front feet and in front of the front feet and land, and it uses those front feet to, to jump forward again. And so the tracks look like they're going backwards, uh, but they're not, it's moving in that direction of the big hind feet. And of course, those big hind feet are where the snowshoe hare gets its name from. So there it is again. And so with that, we wanted to shift gears a little bit. Now that we've talked about some of these things that you can see in the old forests, talk about some places where you can go to an old forest and uh, see what you can find. And we're just going to highlight four places, but there's a number of places around the state that uh, you, can, you might be able to also find old forests. And just some of them are shown on this map here. Liz, maybe you can advance the slide to the next one here. There we go. The first one we want to talk about is in Killington, formerly known as Sherburne. And it's Gifford Wood State Park. And there is no easier old forest to see, I think, than this one. And if you've driven Route 100 through Killington, you've probably driven uh, past this, for this old forest without even realizing it. And because it's Route 100 splits the forest just north of Route 4. And it, there's a, it's a great place to see this old forest because you can pull your car off to the side of the road and you don't even have to get out if you wanna see the old forest that way. Or you can walk on a nice interpretive trail uh, through a section of the old forest. And then there's parts of it without trails uh, that you can wander into uh, if you are careful there. Here's just one of the trees from that forest. There's even a little bit of old forest that, uh, that uh, is near the campground, so you can even camp out there in an old forest. Liz. The next one we'll show you just briefly is a place in Barnard. 
And this is um, where the red star is here. And this is uh, the field property in Barnard, which is Vermont Land Trust conserved property in which uh, the, the landowner wanted to keep the forest um, forever wild. And it had that intention several decades ago. And, and, and so we've been, the management of this has been to just let it be, to just let it go. This is my colleague, David McMath, of the Vermont Land Trust with his dog, Acer. And um, David and I have been collaborating on some things related to old forests and you'll hear from him um, at some point later. But it's a beautiful old forest and you can get to it by public trails. It's private property, but, um, but there are trails through it um, from um, Silver Lake State Park. Bob? Another spot to see an old forest is in Granville Gulf, where there's the Granville Gulf State Forest Reservation, uh, one of the most uniquely named pieces of state-owned property, I think. Uh, this is also on Route 100, uh, and it's the, the narrow pass that maybe you're familiar with between Warren and Granville. Uh, the old forest here is on very steep slopes, uh, but it, because it's on those steep slopes, it really is... Uh, there's really very little evidence of disturbance up there. There's some enrichment because of the way that nutrients are uh, sliding down the slope. And so that tends to really make for some large trees. And here you can see some of what that is like. And then finally in Charlotte, um, we have Williams Woods. This is another one that's right by the road, very easy to get to on Greenbush Road in Charlotte. And if you simply Google or use your map um, app to, to get to Williams Woods in Charlotte, it's a very easy thing to find. And it's a fascinating thing. It's a small area, 60 or so acres owned and managed by the Nature Conservancy. It's a clay plain forest. Um, the clay plain forests dominant in the Champlain Valley at one time were largely cleared, to, cleared and converted to agricultural use because the clay soils are very fertile, very good. Um, but they also, because of their moisture holding capacity uh, in, the, in the clay plain forest, often the roots are close to the surface as in this uh, photo here. So you can find roots close to the surface and look at all that moss on those, on those roots and at that tree base. Um, but very old trees, a lot of really active, active uh, tree fall, wind storms that come through there, and just a very dynamic, fascinating, interesting place. Um, a number of years ago, I, there was a, a, a visitor's log in, in the forest, uh, just a, a notebook in a, in a kiosk, and, and I looked at the, key, the visitor's log, and a visitor had come, and, and it turned out, turned out was a, an expert in natural disturbance dynamics of forests, and, and she reported that she saw the evidence of at least four, maybe five past wind events in this forest, judging by the age of the trees and the direction in which they had fallen. So there's a lot of really fascinating history to this forest, a tiny place, but fascinating. So, well, why do we need old forests anyway? Um, why are we talking about old forests and why do we need old forests? Well, they are a missing component of our landscape. So Williams Woods is, is a, a tiny fragment of what used to occupy the entire Champlain Valley. And some of these forests we have looked at are just, just remnants. There's just tiny, tiny remnants of old, true old growth forest and, and not a lot of old forest. Um, they are ideal habitat for many species, as we've discussed. Um, they, their, their habitat features, the complexity creates biological diversity. So there's habitat diversity, which yields and leads to biological diversity um, in the mosses, in the fungi, in the lichens, in the mammals, in the insects. With their complex, all their complex features and natural tree fall, they perform hydrologic regulation functions, um, keeping water uh, from leaving the forest too quickly, 
um, slowing water down, particularly in some of the extreme rain events that we're having now, um, cleaning water, et cetera. Um, they also, they can protect, with all those fallen trees, they can protect regeneration from herbivory by deer, which is a problem in our forests. Um, large trees, uh, old trees, old forests store more carbon than younger forests, so they perform a really important function that way. And finally, they're just beautiful places that, uh, as Barbara Kingsolver has so eloquently said, People need wild places. We need to be able to taste grace and know once again that we desire it. The idea of uh, protecting old forests and even restoring old forests, trying to to create more old forest on the landscape has been gaining some traction in the, the conservation world. And it's very exciting. I think there's, there's two visions that were created independently. One that Liz and I worked on called Vermont Conservation Design, uh, specific to Vermont, obviously. And then a larger vision for New England called Wildlands and Woodlands uh, by the Harvard Forest. And these independent efforts both came to this idea that having about 10% of Vermont's forest uh, regrowing to be old forest would be a way to reintroduce the ecological functions of old forest into the landscape uh, at a scale that would that would really make uh, really bring that those functions uh, back at a large scale and provide those values at a meaningful scale. Uh, where both these visions, I think, and Vermont conservation design in particular, uh, a big part of that is not just having old forest by itself as sort of these isolated museums, but that we need old forests as part of a larger uh, intact and connected ecologically functional landscape. And that's the vision of, of, of Vermont conservation design and also wildlands and woodlands that we need to think about having whole ecological systems conserved and that old forests are one part of that and a really critical, important, critically important part of that for all the functions that Liz talked about and all of the, the climate resilience and biological diversity that we get from them. Uh, and if we, can, if we can have old forests as one piece of this larger ecologically functional landscape, I think we're, we're really setting our species up and our human communities up to, to really thrive into the future. And that's that's something that I think I can say that both Liz and I are excited about and looking forward to seeing more of that over time. Well, thank you, Bob, um, for that, for wrapping it up so beautifully. Um, we'd like to pause now and um, make some time um, before the top of the hour, before eight o'clock for, um, for a few questions. Great, thank you, Liz and Bob. Um, so just a reminder to folks, if you have questions, please enter them in the Q&A that you see at the bottom of your screen. Um, the first question is from Michael and Michael asks, um, he's read about the woodland jumping mouse and how it can be associated with truffles and he's hoping for some more information on that. Well, I'll take a stab at that. Uh, truffles are, are fungi that, are, that grow in the soil at the base of trees. And uh, I wish I could say a lot more about that, but I, I don't know a lot about them other than they, they seem to be really wildlife attractants. And you can often find where deer have pawed at the base of a hemlock tree to dig up truffles for eating. Uh, so I don't know about the association with woodland jumping mouse, but that's intriguing. And I wanna, I wanna dig more into that and learn more about it. One other interesting uh, thing about truffles is that they are one of the um, one of the important mycorrhizal fungi. Their my, their mycelium are, are mycelia are the uh, one of the one of the ones that interact with um, trees and other vascular plants. So they're important in that regard in the ecosystem. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is from Chrissy, and Chrissy wants to know 
why her dogs are obsessed with moss. She says that no matter where she is, they always go after it and will find it and dig in the snow for it. And she's wondering if it lets out a lets off a particular scent or taste that helps them find it. I, I, I'll try to answer that. I um, don't know what, what it is, but there are, it may well be that um, mosses actually, because there's of all the moisture, they might be interesting in that way, but also because they provide habitat for other things like those snow fleas or other insects um, or, or just other organisms um, that might be hiding there in the moss might be of interest to the dogs. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Ellen and Ellen asks, how can we distinguish moss and lichen? Right, so mosses and, and lichens um, are sometimes hard to tell apart. For the most part, just on a visual, as a visual thing, most lichens are a little bit more, shall I say, a little bit more brittle, and they tend to be lighter in color. Now that lung lichen that we showed you um, is sometimes quite dark green, but many lichens are, are lightish in color, almost grayish as opposed to green. And most of the mosses are, are really quite green green. Um, there's also other, other things. A lot of mosses look like tiny little trees. They have tiny little leaves and some of them, some of them stand up like trees and some of them lie on the ground like this. But if you look closely at them at, at, with your hand lens, with a magnifying lens, you'll see that the mosses have tiny, tiny leaves, often with a mid vein. Um, and it, you actually, to identify the mosses, you need to look closely at those leaves and at the structure of those leaves to tell which moss it is. Sometimes you need to actually put them under a microscope. They're fascinating um, organisms, but just on a, on a very um, quick and easy level, they're, they tend to be more green and the lichens tend to be on more on the gray side. There's also bright orange lichens. So that, that, doesn't, that doesn't fit what I just said about them being gray in color, but generally not, not so green. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is from Janet and Janet asks, are there native species of plants and animals that cannot survive in old forests? Yeah, that's a really great question. And uh, there are certainly species that depend heavily on young forest, uh, particularly some birds and mammals. Uh, but we, we think back about the landscape that these species evolved in and that they lived in prior to uh, Europeans arriving on this continent and having massive changes to the forest. And all of the species that are here had some, all of our native species that were here, uh, had some place in that original forest where they were able to persist. And that might have been small openings within the forest. It could be uh, openings created by beaver and small shrubby wetlands. Uh, but most of the forest, something like 60% of the forest was old forest. Uh, prior to the Europeans changing the landscape. So the species that were here uh, evolved with that old forest landscape, uh, but it was an old forest landscape with a lot of complexity that included young forest and many other types of habitats. So uh, were there species that probably stayed away from where there were just big trees? Yes, but are they not part of an old forest? I guess that really depends on how broadly or narrowly you want to consider an old forest. And I tend to think of it broadly. Great, thank you. Um, so that we have a couple questions that I'm gonna combine here. So we have one person that asks, what role did the indigenous peoples of Vermont play in maintaining and managing forests that we now consider old growth? Um, and then we have another person that asks if there are attempts in Vermont or programs that focus on helping to keep older forests protected for and become even older for us for future generations. Sort of looking back and also looking forward. Um, 
we know some, but not a lot, about indigenous use of, of the forest. Um, what we do know is that the forests, uh, indigenous people used the forests for a variety of things and continue to do so today. Um, value the forests for a lot of the products that are some, some what the word product maybe isn't the right word, but, but uh, mushrooms, fungi, other things that black ash, for example, for baskets, um, all kinds of things that, that occur in the forest um, have been used by people for millennia. Um, we, we think that it's possible that there was some management of, of forests um, by indigenous people, but not, not really that much. It was fairly, um, we think from the evidence that it was fairly limited and fairly spotty. Um, there was not, for example, there's, there's been some thinking that, that there was massive or very large scale, for example, burning of forests um, prior to Europeans settlement. And that is, that is not borne out by the evidence in Vermont. So that kind of use was maybe very limited in scope. Um, the second question I'll leave to Bob. Hey, Maya, can you just repeat that second part of the question? Sure. So the question was about um, programs in Vermont that help to keep older forests um, protected so that they can become even older than they already are. Yeah, and that's really the full range of conservation that we have in Vermont. And there's many different ways that old forests and are being protected and that forests are being protected to become old forests. So there's public lands like state lands. Uh, some of the sites that I talked about are on state lands and where we have those features and know about them, uh, they're likely to be protected into the future, particularly if they're in uh, say a designated state natural area like Gifford Woods. Uh, there's federal areas in the Green Mountain National Forest that are wilderness areas where the forest may not necessarily be old now, but it's gonna grow old over time without uh, future management. There are conservation easements like those that Vermont Land Trust and other organizations use that will sometimes protect old forests. And maybe Liz can talk more about that. There's also uh, some uh, role for old forests in the use value appraisal program or current use where landowners can enroll their land, their forest land uh, in, a, in a tax break program uh, where they commit to keeping it as forest. And there's, if you have an existing old forest in that program, uh, you can continue to manage that as an old forest as part of that program. Liz, did I miss any of the main ways that forests are being protected? That was a great, that was a great summary and also maybe a great way to wrap up. It is eight o'clock. So Maya, I don't know what you think, but I think that we can go to the final slide. And Bob and I are happy to stay around for, um, for a little bit, uh, maybe another 10 or 15 minutes um, to answer. I see there's some, still some other questions in the queue. Um, but, um, but for now, um, Maya, would you like to summarize upcoming events and what's, what's, what people should expect next? Yeah, absolutely. So we'll be sending out an email in a little while um, with a short survey. So we'd love it um, if you could take a chance and fill that out and let us know your thoughts about this event. Um, we also have a few um, other forest related events coming up. Um, on February 8th, we have a um, tree ID webinar with our forestry team at the Land Trust. Um, so we're inviting folks to send in questions ahead of time that they will be answering during the event. Um, we have an event on February 23rd um, about the White River Land Collaborative. And then on March 30th, Liz and Bob are doing another event about old forests. Um, and I'm going to put the link to sign up for that event in the chat. So if you'd like to go ahead and register for that event now, we would love to see you there um, on March 30th. Um, and of course, there's um, lots of information on our website as well. So thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Um, and thank you, Liz and Bob, for that great presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Yeah, thank you for coming. And we will stick around for a few minutes if there are other questions.
Sure, I can I can read you guys a couple more questions. Um, we have one from um, Seth, and he just found that distinctive two and two track pattern um, last week for the first time on his property in South Starksboro. And he's wondering if there are other tracks that resemble that, or if there is definitely a Martin roaming around his property. Well, that's a great question. And when I said distinctive track pattern, I really uh, missed the mark because I should have said it's distinct, the distinctive track pattern of the weasel family. So there are, there are many other or several other uh, weasel family species that could leave that track pattern. Uh, slight variation in size and, and other features might help distinguish them. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question here. Um, somebody asking about hornworts and how easy they are to distinguish from liverworts. Hornworts are weird. They're just weird little things. <laughs> and they are called hornworts because they're, they have a structure that there's a flat, what's called a phallus or, or leaf-like thing. Um, and then emerging from that is the, the reproductive structure is a, is a thing like, like this, um, which is, or like this, maybe it's easier to see, which is a, what's why they called, they're called horn words. And so they are very um, distinctive looking and unusual. And um, when they don't have that, they do look a little bit like certain um, liver words, but when they have that structure, they are very distinct. There's not that many of them. Uh, you don't see them very often. There's only a handful of species in Vermont, and those ones are not very common. I don't see them much at all. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question from Patrick, who's nine years old, and Patrick wants to know how many old forests are there in Vermont? That's a question where we sure wish we could just give a clear single answer, but uh, I don't think we know the exact number. It's something that the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department uh, with our natural heritage inventory, we've been trying to do more tracking of where all these old forests are, entering them into a database with other uh, biological information uh, so that over time we can really get a better handle on just where these old forests are and what condition they're in. Uh, right now we say that I think something like less than 1% of the forest is old forest, but that's an estimate. And I think there's a lot more old forest out there that we don't know about. And uh, it's just waiting to be discovered. Great, thank you. Um, our next question is from Nancy, and Nancy asks, do snow fleas hibernate in tree bark or do they just visit it for food? Yeah, I don't know if they actually hibernate, but they do, do um, shelter themselves in tree bark and, and feed there as well, I think. And again, I'll just say that snow fleas these days are not considered actual insects. So they're, they're kind of a different kind of organism, but there's, there's an, and another sort of interesting thing about snow fleas is that you can have like dozens of species of, they're, they're in a group called springtails and you can have dozens of species of springtail in a single patch of old forest. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question from somebody wondering, at what age do forests become considered old forests? So that's really that 150 year old mark, but it's not like there's some magic thing that happens at that point. It's a gradual accumulation of old forest characteristics that starts really around when a forest is about 100 years old and continues for uh, another 100 or more years for the forest to really develop that structure. And some of that is just time dependent, but it also can vary if there's a lot of disturbance in the forest uh, that can really accelerate the, the accumulation of those structural characteristics. You can't make the trees any older, but you can get more of the, the diversity of, of down trees and tip up mounds and uh, maybe injured trees that then become hollow cavity trees and so forth. Uh, interestingly, just as an aside, there's some 
uh, really good work, and maybe Liz can mention something more about this. Uh, there's, there's work thinking about how forestry and forest management can actually do some of that acceleration of those characteristics as, as well. And again, it doesn't make the forest old, but it can, it can get some of those characteristics faster. We're working on uh, developing some informational materials on that, on how to, how to develop old forest characteristics through management. As Bob said, you cannot create an old forest and, or you cannot create an old growth forest, but you can, you can bring some of the characteristics in. And, um, and it's, you would only want to do that in very, you know, in circumstances where it seems that in most circumstances, just waiting is actually the best thing, but in some cases, um, doing some enhancement is, is possible. So David McMath, my colleague who I mentioned, and I are working with some researchers at the University of Vermont and at um, University of Massachusetts and elsewhere and at the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation um, to develop some um, more information about that. So you'll hear about that in the future. Great, thank you. Um, we have a few questions that have come in about rock tripe and how that might fit in um, to the other things you've talked about. Rock tripe is one of those big lichens. It's a huge, probably the biggest lichen that, that occurs in our area. I've seen rock tripes that are the size of dinner plates. I mean, just huge things on, um, they grow on rocks. That's why they call them rock tripe. Um, and they occur in a, in a lot of different rocky habitats, but again, it needs to be in the shade and it needs to be, um, there needs to be some moisture. They don't like it real dry. Um, so they, I don't know that there's any association of rock tripe with older forests, but again, just because of the shade and so forth, there might be. I don't know. Bob, do you know more about rock? Uh, no, I don't think I have anything to add to that. That was great. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question from Anthony who wonders, are there typical flowering plants in old forests? We, um, we, there are no, there are no uh, flowering plants that we know of that are specifically connected to old forests. Um, there has been some research in Massachusetts that indicates that some flowering plants are more abundant in older forests than in younger for in old growth forests in particular than in younger forests. Um, and interestingly, um, hobble bush might be one of them, uh, a very common plant, but um, in some areas of Massachusetts, they find that it's more common in older forests. Um, hobble bush has beautiful flowers in, in May, beautiful sprays of white flowers. Um, again, you know, again, there's, there's, we do know there's more diversity, there are more species, but nothing that is specifically associated with old forests that we know about. Bob, do you know? Well, one thing we also know is that when a forest is cleared, and particularly if it's used for agriculture, uh, if that land is used for agriculture and then allowed to reforest, that there are many species that are very slow to recolonize that forest. And so places that have stayed as forest over time uh, tend to have more species than those that have been cleared, uh, which is perhaps not surprising, but it, it speaks to, I think, uh, a conservation challenge on our landscape where at one time, uh, something like 70 to 80% of our land was cleared. So species are still in places moving around and recolonizing. And some of those understory plant species are ant dispersed. So they don't, uh, they can't travel very far, very fast. Great, thank you. Um, we have one person asking, how does the soil profile differ in old forests versus younger forests? Bob, you wanna take that one or do you want me to try? Happy to start and please jump in. Uh, Forest soils in general have a lot of variability. And I think one of the things about an old forest soil is that there's, there's disturbance to the trees and that ends up disturbing the soil, uh, particularly with the abundance of tip ups, which is those tree roots tipping up and then 
uh, they take a bunch of soil with it, and then slowly over time, that soil settles and decays. And that's like the same thing as turning over your garden with a spade in the spring. It's, it's cycling that soil, uh, mixing up the layers. And soil scientists talk about how you can, you can sample soils in a forest and go just a few meters apart, and you'll find totally different soil profiles. And I think that that's one of those things that's just going to be that much more exaggerated in an old forest. Uh, in, a, in the original forest, I think there was a much thicker layer of leaf litter, and there's historical accounts that speak to that. And that's one of the things that we've, to some extent, probably lost, but uh, that, that thick duff that accumulates in, in old forests, uh, it might be one of those characteristics that we can regain over time. Uh, and of course, there's the, the mycorrhizal fungi, and maybe that's where I can turn it over to you, Liz. Yeah, in, the, in, in a well-developed old forest, those mycorrhizal networks are well-developed, and they're not absent in younger forests, but, um, but they're, they're different, and they take time to develop. Um, another thing is that occasionally in a very young forest, one that has been used for agriculture for a long time, you can still see a plow layer in the soil profile that the first few inches of the soil profile is, is one that had been, has become uniform um, through plowing year after year after year. So that is sometimes still visible. Another thing is that, is, is that um, the development of different soil layers takes time. And so, so you'll see that the soil layers developed better, the different horizons better developed in an older forest soil. Another thing about soils in, in forests is earthworms, um, which is um, all the earthworms that occur here in Vermont and in the Northeast are not native. They're actually, they're, there are one or two native species, but they're extremely rare. So almost all of the earthworms that you see in the soil are, um, are not native. So older forests that have never been disturbed and where people have not been with fishing gear, for example, may be free of uh, earthworms, whereas younger forests um, often will have had that disturbance and will have earthworms, which very can very dramatically change the soil profile. Um, changing the amount of organic matter and, and so forth. Great, thank you. So I think we'll probably stop there. Um, I'm sorry that we weren't able to get to everyone's questions, um, but thank you again so much for joining us this evening. Um, and we'd love to see you all again at our next Old Forest event on March 30th. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maya, for hosting. Thanks, Bob, for doing this together. Yeah, thanks. Thanks thank to you. you. Thanks all. All right. Take Take care, care, everyone. Everybody. Take care.